I'm not criticizing that position. I'm saying that's the position where you can't really think like a wealthy person because you're only thinking about survival. And that is really the differentiating factor. Once you can get out of that survival mode of being stuck in the, you know, the average person's dilemma, then you can have more of a capacity to start designing your life the way you want it to. And you can start to develop your ideas around how to start actually getting wealthy. Ah, welcome back, my friends, to another episode of The New Wave Entrepreneur. I am so excited to have you here today because we are kicking off part one of a three-part series called Money Moves. What is this series about? This is all about how to get your money right, how to make more money, how to save more wisely, and how to invest to grow your money and create real wealth, or as we say, protect your assets, okay? Now, uh, here's the thing. Not everyone comes into the into adulthood with full financial literacy. In fact, most of us, myself included, have to find that information for ourselves. So this podcast series, this, these next three podcasts that I'm producing, are in an attempt to give you the foundational things you're going to need to know, or at least the things you're going to need to start thinking about and researching on your own time to make sure that you understand what's going on with your money. And this is all leading up to my Money Moves Workshop, which is a new workshop that we're producing live, so you can attend live and ask questions, or you can watch it streaming anytime, and it comes out January 27th, and if you go to new wave entrepreneur forward slash workshop, you can see all the information for that new workshop, Money Moves. Make sure you get your ticket today. Okay, now let's get into today's episode. I have three pieces of really big, meaty material that I want to lay out for you, and what I decided to do is kind of break them down into actionable episodes that you can implement over a series of days or weeks to really start thinking about what it means to improve your money, you know, to improve your financial health, to improve your financial life. So here are the three different episodes that you're going to be hearing over the course of this Money Moves series. The first is part one, Money Moves part one, which is understanding the money game. Okay. And this is all about understanding the poor versus rich mindset, why wealthy people end up having a, a, almost a different mentality around money than someone who's never experienced wealth. We're going to talk about uh, knowing your numbers. We're going to talk about financial hygiene. Uh, we're going to talk about the power of compounding and also understanding basic portfolio foundations. And that's all happening today. But on our next podcast, in the next edition of this Money Move series, we're going to talk specifically about how to make more. Okay. And that's really what it, what it comes down to is we're going to learn the process and the, the structure for creating successful uh, wealth, but how do we actually make more and how do we fill up that bucket in the meantime? How do we go out and create more money so that we can use that money to create long-term wealth? Well, that's going to be uh, Money Moves Day 2. That's creating wealth. That's really becoming the hustler, creating more cash, uh, how to generate more income at your nine to five job or how to start a freelance business or how to create or improve upon products you already have to create more cash. So that's day two. And day three is portfolio setup 101. So how to stack it, you know, how we should think about where to place our money, because of course, uh, just saving your money in a savings account isn't enough anymore, my friends. It's In fact, it hasn't been enough since probably about the 50s. You need to be investing your money to beat inflation to make you wealthy. And so we're going to talk about what those investments would look like. Obviously, crypto is a huge part of the new wave philosophy, but it's not the only part of your portfolio you should be paying attention to. And it's actually, you know, obviously it's the most volatile part. So you want to create other areas of uh, another asset classes that are going to keep you uh, safeguarded, even while you're still growing tremendously with crypto. Okay, so those are the three parts of this workshop series. Again, this is all leading up to the Money Moves Workshop, which we're producing live, and you can come attend live and ask questions, or you can watch it after. Just go to newwaveentrepreneur.com forward slash workshop. Now, let's dig into it. Kicking this off, Money Moves Part 1, Understanding the Money Game. Okay, I've been writing about this for a few weeks now, and I've been digging into my lessons as a young man that I learned around money. And I think what I came... The conclusion that I came to uh, more than anything was that I just wasn't taught a lot about money. I wasn't taught much negativity around money, but I also wasn't really taught anything positive. I was almost left a blank slate, which is good in some ways, except that it means I feel that I was slow to start in understanding the concepts around not just not just what they tell you in school, but the actual reality around how to make money and how to think about money. 
you have to think about this. We are not given an advantage as a as a population around uh, understanding the money game. The majority of people don't understand how money is actually created and how it is stored and, and, and built into personal wealth. We have this idea that part of it comes down to luck, another part of it comes down to lineage, and of course there's some skill mixed in there in between. But when you start to understand how money works, it becomes easier for you to see yourself making it because you see that it's not just favoritism from some uh, benevolent God. It's actually something that you can be uh, skilled around, that you can that you can learn. And of course, understanding that money itself is um, is is not real. Okay, it's it's a creation that we've that we have developed psychologically as humans to transmit value. So let's talk about that really quickly, and let's talk about the the difference between the poor mindset around money and the rich or the wealthy mindset around money and there's some debate as to whether rich and wealthy are even different terms in, in and of themselves i think they are now if you've read robert kiyosaki's book um, poor dad rich dad or rich dad poor dad it's an allegory essentially it's a story that's designed to teach you the different ways of thinking about money and illustrate the fact that when you don't come from money, you don't have the pre-installed software to understanding how it works. You're only taught what you learn on TV or you're taught what your parents uh, learned from, you know, from their from their small amount of experience with it. If they didn't have it, they wouldn't have a lot of experience with it. You're going to absorb their fears, their frustrations, their limitations, their ideas of what success looks like. You're going to absorb all that stuff. Even if you weren't directly taught it, you're going to see it just through being around it. And the poor mindset, let's talk about a couple of things that come to mind when I think of the poor mindset. You know, the first thing I think with the poor mindset is generally scarcity. And it's scarcity because we see uh, as people who, or, or I should say people who don't come from a lot of money, which I don't come from a lot of money. And most people in America, you know, are part of the average class, you know, so that would be middle class all the way down. Most of us aren't coming from Bruce Wayne, Richie Rich, you know, uh, landed gentry money backgrounds. And so most of us look at money as being this finite resource almost as if it were gold mined in the ground and there's only so much of it and we can have to collect of it, of it as much as we can and hoard of it hoard it as much as we can so we see it as something that's finite we see it as something that is going away we see it as something that is uh, that can be taken from us we see it as something that is non-replenishable non-renewable we see it as something that um, there that that we don't actually have directly control over now the wealthy see money quite differently one they see it as a tool they see it as they see it as their servant, not being a servant of the money. They see money as something that they can use to make more of itself. They see money as an exchange of value and also an exchange of their time. They see money as something that is not to be feared but to be conquered. They feel differently about money. I think one of the biggest things is that if you come from a normal average background or a lower class background, you often uh, equate your time on, on, a, on an hourly basis to a certain amount of uh, money that you're used to making. And what I found is so interesting is that the because there's a federal minimum wage in the United States, we often peg our dollar value to a certain a certain number that is somewhere along the spectrum of the minimum wage spectrum. So right now in the U.S., I believe minimum wage is still 7.25, which honestly is outrageous in 2022. But I believe the minimum wage is still 7.25, something uh, somewhere along those lines. And of course, if you are a so if so if you're working a, a McDonald's job and you're making ten dollars an hour, you're making above minimum wage. If you're working a uh, a, a, a job with a college degree. You're, you know, you could be making 20, 30, 40 or $50 an hour. When you're working a job with a graduate degree or a doctorate, you could be making, you know, $100 or more per hour pretty easily. And a lot of times we base our, our assumptions around money on the multiple that it is above minimum wage. Oh, we say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm making, uh, you know, seven, I'm making uh, 40 bucks an hour. That's like seven, eight times minimum wage or, you know, uh, five times minimum wage, six times minimum wage. And it's so true. But minimum wage, of course, is, is an artificial number that's been created. And so we're, we're 
coming up with comparisons based on something that's been created uh, by people who aren't ad- adhering to the minimum wage. So it's interesting that we would see that as something to gauge our own success off of. Certainly, I'm speaking for myself. Now, I don't go by an hourly rate anymore, and I think a lot of rich and wealthy people don't either. Or if they do go by an hourly rate, it's a very exorbitant rate. I was reading uh, Naval's book, and Naval Ravikant, and he said that even when he was a kid, he thought about his hourly rate as being very, very high because he wanted to continually push his boundaries and he thought he didn't want to do anything that wasn't worth his time. And even as a young, uh, a young teenage, young 20 year old entrepreneur, he put his hourly rate at $5,000 an hour because he thought that's the value of my time and I don't want to do tasks that aren't worth that amount. I thought that was funny. But I think there's also a, um, a mentality to understand in that. That's a rich mentality. That's a wealthy mentality. And that's also an entrepreneurial mentality of your time really is it's invaluable. It's the only thing you can't get back. And wealthy people and rich people are looking to maximize the amount of time that they have and they're willing to trade their money for that. And of course, to maximize that wealth, they would have other people doing the things for them that aren't worth their time while they're doing the things that only are are high value. That's an entrepreneurial uh, mindset. Now, of course, when you're in the beginner's mindset of just being a, uh, you know, someone who doesn't know anything about money, you'll be happy to work a long, long week, especially if it's for a good paycheck. But over time, you'll find that there's no hourly rate, at least this is from my experience, there's no hourly rate that can truly satisfy your needs as a human. Because most of the jobs that have hourly rates, they cap out at a certain level. Any, any, profession that is still getting paid hourly or even to a certain extent uh, salaried, there's going to be a cap on it because if there's a salary, there's a company and a boss and probably bosses above him or her above, above. And so you want to either be someone who's creating money that's constantly replenishing itself, uh, i.e. passive uh, income, investment uh, dividends, returns, or you want to be someone who's making so much money that there is no salary cap. And uh, when you're coming from a modest financial background, you just don't have the concept for you know what it would be like to uh, to not have to be tied down to a certain amount of uh, dollar per hour or not having to have a, a specific type of uh, salary. And I think that um, it's almost it's funny because uh, I think as you get to a certain point in your in your financial journey, uh, you almost forget what it's like to work a nine to five, and you have to realize this is the reality of most of us stuck in the matrix. Most people are still working a nine to five, and as you start to open up, uh, you know, uh, businesses, and as you start to make more, where you don't need to report to a boss, it almost seems foreign to have your day attached to a uh, a dollar amount. But that's truly what it is when you're working for your dollars. And so this is the mindset shift that I had. You know, when I when I was just understanding that entrepreneurship was the right path for me, I thought there's no dollar amount that can equate to how much value I give on my life. There's no uh, dollar per breath that I could assign to myself. Therefore, I want to make it a, a, as close as possible to never having to worry about how much I'm making when I'm working. And that means I need to create, uh, you know, a an opportunity for myself that has infinite earning potential. For me, that's business. And of course, uh, there are there are ways of improving your business game and your your mindset around this stuff. But this is that was the that was the uh, the spark that really lit me aflame. And when you talk about again, poor versus rich mindset, what's another differentiator? Well, poor people see their their money as the food. Or, you know, and I should almost distinct, make a distinction when I say poor people. Really what I mean is I mean people who have just not been given uh, financial literacy or not been, not achieved financial literacy, which was also me at a certain point. And I'm using poor almost in the context of Richard or Robert Kiyosaki. Again, we're making an extreme distinction here. But when I say poor, I just mean people who are still developing their financial literacy. When you're still developing your financial literacy, uh, you are very much likely to see your money as the fruit and not the seed. You plant your seed deep in the ground to hopefully grow trees, right? You don't just eat every fruit that comes your way. And most of us, when we get paid, we take that money, we spend it, and then we have to go run on that treadmill to make more. But a rich or a wealthy person sees that the money that they're making today is the seed of the fruit that they'll be eating tomorrow, is the seed of the grain that they'll be baking into the bread that they'll be putting on their table tomorrow. It's all a long-term play. It's more complex. And so you don't want to be 
uh, stuck in a situation where you're what's called hand to mouth, where everything that you make has to go back into just staying alive. And I've been there before, so I'm not I'm not criticizing that position. I'm saying that's the position where you can't really think like a wealthy person because you're only thinking about survival. And that is really the differentiating factor. Once you can get out of that survival mode of being stuck in the, you know, the average person's dilemma, then you can have more of a capacity to start designing your life the way you want it to. And you can start to develop your ideas around how to start actually getting wealthy. So this is, you know, this is a distinction to make. So that is, those are some of my thoughts on poor versus wealthy mindset. Some of the things uh, that they see differently. Now let's talk, let's go a little bit deeper into understanding this money game. Okay, you have to know your numbers. And again, the whole point, the reason why we're here is to develop a better understanding for our relationship with money, for our for how we're going to improve our money, for how we're going to make it better. We have to know our numbers in order to make it better. And this is all part of financial hygiene. Every week I look at my numbers. Okay, every week I look at my bank accounts. I look at my credit card statements. I look at the uh, the debts that I owe. I look at the money coming in and out. And I actually will, every single week on Sundays, go line for line and look at every line that came into my bank accounts or went out to make sure that it matches with the expenses that I'm expecting to see um, based on based on what I'm tracking. And it took me a while to develop this, this whole financial hygiene approach. No one taught me to do this. I decided myself, wow, I don't really know what's going on here. I need to figure this out. And over a period of years, I developed a just a spreadsheet system and a simple way of checking in where I look at all of my numbers every week. And I, this is my financial checkup. I call this my CFO Sunday. And every Sunday, I have to look at my numbers to understand them. I think that we are scared of our numbers often. We're scared of learning what we will find because we're probably neglecting them. We're scared of making a mistake well, it's also boring. A lot of people don't like looking at numbers. It's not exciting to them. It's not the creative part of the business or of, of you know, life. If you don't have a business, this podcast is still highly applicable to you. And if you are working at a job where you're looking to make more money by, you know, getting deeper into the company, by becoming, a, you know, a leader in your company, or whether you're working on just building a big business or, or business that makes you, you know, tons of money, that's great too. Either way, you have to know your numbers and you have to know where you are. Otherwise, you can't go anywhere new. This is why, uh, you know, it's been said, what gets measured gets managed. And I think, so I think it's so important to have a deep and frequent understanding of your numbers. And this is something important to think about. You know, when you have um, a bookkeeper or an accountant, they're looking at a postmortem, okay? They're looking at uh, what has happened in the past. They can't really give you an accurate prediction of what you're doing now and how that will affect what's going to happen in the future. I mean, obviously they can say stop spending, but only you can look at what you're doing today, what you just did yesterday and make a judgment call for yourself. The, the accountants and the bookkeepers, they shouldn't be the ones that are responsible for, uh, for interpreting, understanding or, or, or uh, helping you. You know, they're going to be your, they're only as good as you are basically. And that's what I've learned through working with, uh, bookkeepers through working with accountants yes you want to find people who are uh, highly qualified but the more engaged you are with your finances the better they're going to be able to help you and at the end of the day you're still responsible for knowing how much you have where it is you know and all those critical details so don't forget that and you can even look at what happened with wesley snipes you can't blame anybody but wesley for not paying his taxes although i'm sure wesley would say well damn like this is the reason why i have an accountant this is the reason why i hire them this is the reason why i'm rich and famous to get other people to help me do this and that's so true but at the same time it's still your responsibility and i'm mine too you know so there's no situation in which you're not going to be responsible for uh your for your income even though you might have other people helping you with it so you have to know so this these are the these are how things start to gradually unwind as you understand the money game one realize there is at least a difference between having a poor mindset and having a rich or a wealthy mindset and i encourage you to read robert kiyosaki's book too as well you can check it out on amazon uh, rich dad poor dad it's an old book it's a classic book now but it's worth it um, then again, knowing your numbers, you know, really understanding how much money you have going in and how much money you have going out. Uh, a great book for this is called, it's called, let's see, oh, what is it called? It is by Mike Michalowicz, Profit First. This is a bit, this is a book specifically for entrepreneurs, but I will say this, 
I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work exquisitely well with someone who is just in a career. Basically, all it is is learning how to separate your bank accounts uh, or, or, your, or your bank account based on what your needs are and then putting aside enough for spending, saving, taxes, investment, and then having it on a system. Now, of course, it's written for someone who has a business, but I think that there's a lot of wisdom in it. And I think it's 92% applicable to anyone who is in a high-powered career or someone who really wants to get control of their money. And I still use elements of Profit First uh, to run in my daily life, whether or not I'm thinking about business. So it's very, very, it's a great uh, way of thinking about your money and, and, and uh, making things more organized systems, building systems around it. So, you know, understand the mindset differences, understand that your uh, your numbers have to be rock solid. You really got to know your numbers. That's financial hygiene. Don't be afraid of looking at what you have going on there. You know, it's much better to understand and to know the truth and then to find the solution rather than hope that, you know, you get it right and know that you're avoiding it or neglecting it. And this is with all areas of our lives here, not just, um, not just you know, uh, money. It's, all, it's so true. Face your demons, right? Many of us have some sort of mental block around money. And so we have to just face it and get in there. Understand the money game. You know, another piece that I want to talk about too is the power of compounding. People who are beginning in, in money don't really understand that the power really is in compounding, compound interest. Um, obviously, like we have all this, uh, you know, this craze around crypto and I'm, I'm deep into crypto. I'm super bullish. I'm going to be there uh, for the ups and the downs. But compound interest is nuts, man. Even even uh, Albert Einstein said this. He said compound interest is like the ninth wonder of the world, something like that. But just the idea that... Uh, that you can put money in and without putting any more money on the principal, it continues to gain interest. Uh, that alone is a powerful, powerful concept. Uh, for as much as I hate bankers, you know, I don't, I don't feel like they're often uh, almost ever really in the people's interest. Creating compound interest was a product that banks created and good job for you guys. Now, why is that so important to understand? Well, I'm sure you talked about compound interest in high school, but if you're like me, you heard about it and thought it was pretty amazing, but you didn't put too much thought into it after that. And I think especially with seeing what we're coming into uh, with, you know, the economy over the next five to 10 years, you know, possibly even sooner, we are having crazy inflation. And the only thing that can really beat inflation is healthy, healthy interests on the money that you're making. Now, if you put your money in a bank, it's going to make less than 1% on anything you put in there. And as we talked about before on the show, you know, the inflation rate is somewhere around 7% right now. I think it's probably higher, maybe close to 10 and let's just say it's seven for sake of argument. If you're putting in, by the way, average interest rates on banks are below 1%, but let's say it's 1%. So we're being as generous as we can on both ends. So if you look at a savings account, checking accounts are even lower. If you look at a savings account, average saving account gets 1% interest per year. Uh, so that means on every $100, you're making $1. Every, uh, every dollar is losing, or every $100 is also losing money per year. Or well, I should say every dollar is losing 6%, and then the bank can only gains 1%. So 5% is what you're losing every year. That's assuming that, you know, you're making 1% in a savings account, which might be high. And it's assuming that inflation is only 7%, which might be low. So you're losing, or, or well, from 6% would be 5 So you're losing about 5% every single year. That means that for every $100 you put in, it's worth $5 less every year. And the only way to beat that is through interest. You need to put your money somewhere that goes faster than the inflation. And of course, we know that if you just look at, for instance, the uh, the stock market, and we'll talk about this in uh, the third installment of this podcast series, when you just talk about the stock market, you know that on average, on just average over the past uh, you know century plus, the U.S. stock market, the S&P 500, which has seen many different companies come and go, but the, that market in general, the top 500 companies have returned an average of 10%. Now, some years it's much higher than that, and some years it's much lower, but it has returned an average of 10%. And so we know that it's going to grow at least 10% if you don't, well, it's going to go 10% period, and that's, that's so if you take the money that it's going to compound by, which is that 10%, and you add money to that principal, and it starts to com compound on the fact that you're adding more to the principal, and you're also making the money on the interest, over time it goes up and up and up. And you start to make a really nice nest egg for yourself. And that's, of course, assuming that it doesn't go higher. In fact, in the third installment of this where we talk about portfolio, I'm going to talk to you about ETFs, which are exchange-traded exchange -traded funds, uh, and how they're, they're doing pretty well between 10 and 20%, which is really, really strong uh, with, some, uh, with some ETFs. And they're great hedges for the, the 
violent fluctuations in crypto. I'm still bullish on crypto, but you, you have more than one type of asset class. And so understanding this compounding is really, really nice because once you realize that, you say, oh, okay, so if compound interest is where it's at, then all my money shouldn't be sitting in the bank. Because again, uneducated financial mindset is make the money, spend the money, save it in a bank, right? That's what we're taught. We aren't taught much more than that. That's like the bus stop that I got off on and I had to go all the rest of the way myself. Well, really, the strategy is a bit more complex. It's more like make the money, eliminate eliminate extraneous expenses, spend on things that you really care about, um, make as much as you can within your existing profession or create more cash through something on the side and then save some of that money and then invest some of that money and then here are all the different places where you can invest. So there's a different strategy you know, for this, but... Again, you want to see, you want to find things that actually create more money than you're losing via inflation. These are just the basic building blocks of understanding. Okay, it's not actually good for me to only make money and spend it and hope that I can keep making it. It's not necessarily good if I don't know how much I have going in and going out each month. You know, talking about knowing your financial numbers as well, you should know pretty much down to the dollar, you know, or down to within a certain range, what your expenses are each month. And you should know how much you have coming in. You should know what that what that number should look like at the end of the month, your P&L, your personal profit and loss. So whether you're a business or an individual, you should know your what your P&L looks like on a monthly basis. You should know this stuff. And you should know the power of compounding. You know, you should understand that these are the tools that are designed to help you with, with money, you know. And it really, the gap really is just an education. It's not in skill. This is not hard stuff. It's not hard to do. And I guess we could talk really about foundations of a portfolio for a second, because we talked briefly about the power of compounding and why it's so important. What I think is important to know is that compounding is awesome, and there are many different ways to compound your money. And specifically, when you're putting together a portfolio, there are a few different elements that I really, really like. Um, Obviously, like you want to have crypto. That's a a no-brainer. And that's I believe, as I'll continue to say, I think it's volatile, short and medium term. I think it's um, a safe bet for the big ones long term. You know, at least Ethereum and Bitcoin, the rest, who knows? But certainly the big ones, certainly maybe even top 10 or top 100. You know, we'll see how those go. But crypto, obviously. But then if you look at the whole pie, you have to think to yourself, how much of your portfolio do you want in crypto? Now, it depends on what stage of your wealth you're in. For me, I'm pretty young. I'm 33. I'm not super young, but I'm not super old. I have some time to be a little bit more uh, risky and a little bit more uh, fast play with my game. So I have more of my portfolio in crypto right now. I have over 50% of my portfolio in crypto, although I would like to dial that down, uh, dial it back a bit and maybe stay right at 50 or maybe go a bit below because traditional equities, stocks are another great asset class to have. One, they can go up very quickly as well. They can also make big gains. And we've seen uh, some some uh, funds, which we'll talk about, which have done really, really well over the past couple of years. But they're not going to see the gains like crypto. You're not going to see 10,000%, 400%, 300% gains on stocks, typically. It's just not going to happen. And then with a balanced portfolio, that's why it's like 10% over time. You're just, But you're not going to see those crazy gains. But if you look at the macro of your whole portfolio, so you have... Inside of a stock portfolio, you have different stocks, obviously. Nike, Apple, Amazon, those are all stocks in your portfolio. But then in your overall portfolio, you have different asset classes. So you have cash, crypto, stocks, uh, property, um, you know, 401k, life insurance, you could even say is in your portfolio. These are all various forms. These are all types of assets with various forms of or various degrees of liquidity. So yes, so you want to go for crypto. You want to go for stocks. You want to have some cash in your portfolio too. Just meaning, you know, that, that could be your savings essentially. Um, now I would recommend you put it in something that has a bit of a higher yield savings. So if you're looking at, for instance, this could be in your crypto. This could be in a, st- in a stable coin that is being staked for, you know, a very nice return. They have stable coins that are staking at, you know, hundreds of percent. Well, I, I don't actually know which ones those are. I've heard of them. But at least, for instance, if you have, um, you know, you could take your cash and you could put it into Ethereum and stake that. And that becomes, well, I guess that becomes more of a crypto asset then. I guess if you're just talking cash, you could put your money into a traditional savings account. You know, having that cash lay around, you are losing some to inflation. But the best thing about that is it's immediately accessible. You don't have to convert it from a stock and wait. You don't have to 
uh, convert it from crypto, lose money on capital gains, or have to pay capital gains tax, uh, have to, you know, have transaction fees. So cash is just in there. So you have cash, you have crypto, you have stocks, you have real estate. Again, we're talking about what a basic portfolio would look like. You have real estate. That's a great piece, a uh, great asset to add to your portfolio. You have uh, 401ks and IRAs. You have uh, life insurance. Um, these are all things. You even have hard assets. You have precious metals, gold, silvers. You have, uh, you know, even other things, gems, collectibles. These are all assets as well. Where do those fit in your portfolio? So understanding basic portfolio uh, structure is important as well. And you don't have to have all these at once. I don't have all these, by the way. I got cash. I got crypto. I got stocks. I got life insurance. Uh, I don't have any real estate yet. And I don't have an IRA right now. I don't have a 401k because I don't work for an employer. That's an employee, uh, employer savings plan that's connected to the stock market, like a mutual fund. An IRA is individual retirement account, which has tax savings depending on when you take that money out. So I don't have an IRA yet. I will get one. So these are basic portfolio pillars. So start thinking about these things. You don't have to get these all at once, but these are how you move from through dedication fr- to from poor to surviving to thriving to rich to wealthy poor to surviving to thriving to living to giving Ooh, let me see if i could poor to surviving to thriving to living to giving and i'm gonna say i'm gonna actually change that first one say from struggling There you go, some branding right there. These are the things you'll need to go from struggling to surviving to thriving to living to giving at every income level. (laughs) I'd say struggling is below the poverty line or right around it. Surviving is once you have all your needs met. Thriving is once you have more than your needs. Living is once you are just just having way too much fun and giving is when you've had so much fun that you're giving it back. So... Uh, these are these are my ideas around money, and I hope this is a great prelude to what we're going to learn over these next few uh, few sessions. And also remember, this is all a prelude to the Money Moves Workshop. Now, this is happening uh, January. God, we're, okay, we're almost in February already. This is happening January twenty seventh. Okay, we're going to record this live. So if you get a ticket, you can show up to that live recording. You can ask questions. You can engage. You can talk to our speakers. You can be part of this live studio audience. I highly encourage you to do so. Or you can buy it and stream it any time afterwards. It's available beginning on uh, beginning on January twenty seventh. And you can actually uh, grab your ticket now at newwaveentrepreneur.com slash workshop. So this is where you're going to learn all the extended ideas around money moves. But I hope this gave you a great idea of where you can start thinking up today. So go ahead and pick up Rich Tad Board Ad. Go ahead and pick up uh, Profit First. These are some books to get. Go ahead and start looking at your portfolio and start to understand where you can get, you know, where you can get some of these these small little pieces tied up. Because during our next podcast, we're going to be talking about how to make more. So how to make more at your job that you already have, how to make more in your business, which you're already working at, or how to basically start a side hustle or a side business if you don't have one already. And we're going to take that money and we're going to pour it into your portfolio, essentially, understanding how to look at it, how to move it, how to manage it, how to invest it. First, you got to have more to use. So we're going to create more. And that's the next podcast. So tune in for that much love my friends if you're watching this on youtube make sure you go ahead and hit that like button hit that bell so you know when we make a new uh, a new episode if you're listening to this on the itunes platform or on the spotify platform make sure you are subscribed to this as well and guys wherever you're listening to this or watching this make sure that you have leave a comment i read all the comments and i respond to as many as i can and make sure you're giving this show love much appreciation everyone newwaveentrepreneur.com is where you can get all the updates and everything that we're doing I will talk to you on the flip side because the water is warm and the tide is rising. It's time to surf this new wave. Del Di Piazza, out.